Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles show that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly program where we talk about anything that has to do with the Beatles, any part of their past, and even the present, and anything in between. It's an all-encompassing show regarding the Beatles, and I'm Ken Michaels, one of the four regular co-hosts of the show, and some of you might know my other program called Every Little Thing, which is syndicated around the country, and actually, since it's the internet, the world. And I'm being joined by my regular co-host, first of all, from Beatles Examiner, we have Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. And two of the writers for Beatle Fan Magazine, Al Sussman. Hi, Ken. Hello there, everybody. And we also have Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ken, and hello, everyone. And joining us once again is our special guest, who does the evening shift on New York's WFUV. And uh, big Beatle fans, been with the radio station for 30 years now, which is a tremendous accomplishment, especially in this business, to be at the was, same radio station. I didn't think he was that old. <laughs> 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 and of course, being I'm like the, Darren Devo. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm like the carpeting at WFUV. I'm worn out, but still there. Now, hi, everyone. And people walk all over you there. <laughs> you... <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Anyway, uh, on the program this this time out, I thought that uh, well, actually, it was Alan's idea that we should do a show about the Traveling Wilburys. And uh, as many of you know, this was a super group that was formed around the time of uh, George's Cloud Nine album with uh, Jeff Lynne, along with George, and uh, Roy Orbison, Tom Petty, and Bob Dylan. And they released two albums called Volumes 1 and 3. I'm still waiting for number two. I don't know if any of you have a copy of number two. <laughs> But, I actually do um, have a, a volume two, but it's not of the, uh, how would they say, uh, legal persuasion. Okay. <laughs> right. So uh, this will be an interesting show because in many ways we all kind of covered this as it happened, whether, whether it was in Beatle Fan or Darren, you and I were both on the radio when uh, the first album debuted, and we can remember the reaction very well of how uh, people responded, the fans people in the media, but um, this was really something that kind of caught us all by surprise, because when we first found out about the Wilburys, uh, we learned that there was a song that was recorded called Handle With Care, which originally was going to be a B-side for one of the singles from Cloud Nine called This Is Love, and it was too good to be just a B-side, and of course it had all five of these superstars, so they ended up recording an entire album rather quickly. They had a window of time of like two weeks to record an album. And so they put together this one album, which caught everybody by surprise. And uh, just having all these superstars together on the same album uh, as as part of the same group was pretty amazing to itself. And I uh, just want to know, first of all, from each of you, your own take of when you first found out about them and what your reaction was when you heard that first album. We'll also talk about their second album too but let's start with um well how about you darren um you know i honestly don't remember the very first time i heard that what what traveling wilbury is going to be all about um i what i do remember a little clearer was uh, of course i was uh, completely excited about the success that george was having with cloud nine jeff producing that and um but I don't actually have a recollection of the first time I heard that the, this this great supergroup was coming together. It was at an exciting time uh, for you know for uh, for fans of all the artists uh, for them to come together. Jeff Lynn seemed to be all over the place at that time, and uh, it just it, it was almost like a perfect companion to Cloud Nine, the album, and uh, instantaneously kind of made everybody a. a you know, who, who those who weren't familiar with the others, a fan of all five of uh, all five of them. It was just just a true so, and so much fun too, uh, the album. But uh, I wish hmm. I could remember specifically the first time I heard about who the Traveling Wilburys were and and uh, heard Handle with Care for the first time. Hmm. Okay. 
Well, I, I know from my perspective, certainly with Handle With Care, I remember hearing that when it first came out, and I was really so impressed with the fact that all these different vocals were, were showcased on the song. And, you know, I love when, when bands can do that, which isn't that often, let's face it. But, uh, you know, the whole Roy Orbison part, I'm So Tired of Being Lonely, which was perfect for him. And, you know, the Bob Dylan part in there, you know, and George doing the lead vocals through most of the song. It was just, uh, you know, incredible to get all that talent together and to hear most of them with lead vocals. And it's just a great, powerful song, too. Very catchy, too. I'm sorry, just out of curiosity, where did you first hear it? It's probably, you know, it wouldn't have been because I was on WDHA then, right. at the rock station in New Jersey, doing right. my show, but I'm only there one day a week. I was only there one day a week. But I would have heard it, I'm sure, on WNEW mm-hmm. in, in New York around that time because that's what, they, that's what they were playing. And because of the fact that George was so hot at the moment with Cloud9 and, uh, you know, it, it was just something that would have been an automatic song to play given the nature of George being on it, Jeff Lynn producing it having all these other stars on there. I mean, Tom Petty was one of the, and still is, one of the biggest rock stars of the time, Mm -hmm. and still now, Mm -hmm. and having Bob Dylan, an icon on there. And Roy Orbison was really a nice addition, too. I I just, uh, you know, knowing the respect that all those artists had for Roy, but to have Mm -hmm. him join them, because, you know, you didn't see Roy in any other capacity other than just being the solo star really right so uh i just remember hearing it a lot on rock radio uh top 40 radio didn't play it not that i remember but certainly in new york Mm city wnew was the station and i also lived on long island then and their rock station at the time wbab they played it so that's where i normally heard it but uh you know it was it was handled with care first and then and then of course the album and uh nobody knew what to expect with the album but um, I was really, and still am, blown away by it because it's such a, a fun release. It's not just the music itself. It was the attitude of the five musicians. Just the main purpose was to have fun and not take themselves so seriously. And in the course of, of the few weeks that they recorded this, they, they made some really fine tracks, which, uh, you know, that's, that's one of the wonders of... Um, you know, if, if an artist, the Beatles did this so often, they, they wrote a song quickly and went into the studio quickly, and decisions were made quickly as to how songs took shape. And when you think about the fact that these songs, at least to my understanding, were new compositions, I don't really know if any of them were had been lying around from any of the five members. Certainly, I, I would have known about George if, if they were older songs, I think. But, um, you know, the fact that that was so spontaneous that something happens so quickly in the studio. And when you've got the talent of these five people all together, working together, and the fact that it was all done within the span of a couple of weeks, that was extraordinary, even with the fact that you had all this talent. So, um, you know, I love every aspect of that first album. And uh, I suppose the one thing that struck me most of all, this is the one observation that I tell most people about the Traveling Wilburys, is that, if you were to listen to the vocals of, say, Bob Dylan and Roy Orbison, you couldn't find two people that sound more different. <laughs> you know, you have this incredible variety of voices there, and yet they somehow blended so well together, and they made it work. And that, mm-hmm. apart from the fact that the songs are so great, you've got this operatic voice in Roy Orbison, and then you've got the, you know, the very gruffy sounding, and even more to this day... <laughs> Bob Mm -hmm. Dylan. I mean, you couldn't have more of a contrast there. I mean, I could easily see, you know, George and Tom Petty and Jeff Lynne vocally sounding similar, but Dylan and Orbison in the same band? You know, I really couldn't (laughs) hear that vocally, but somehow it worked, you know? So there was a lot of magic, not only in the music, but just in the chemistry of those five. Yeah, I can't remember the first time I, 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 I heard it, but what I do remember now that I'm listening to you, Ken, is at WFEV, which was a very different place uh, in the late 80s from where it is now. Um, mm. What I remember was that, because we had a bunch of Beatle fans, including myself, 
Uh, I remember there being one of the DJs who was a huge Tom Petty fan. Uh, we were all, uh, in some respects, all interested in Bob Dylan. I was, I'll be honest with you, I was a little in the dark. I knew who Roy Orbison was, but wasn't terribly familiar with um, his legacy. Uh, deep, you know, talking deep. But what I remember about the Traveling Wilburys album was that every track on the album we were playing, which was unheard of. Mm. We usually tried to keep it to maybe two or three of a current album. That was one where it was fair game, the whole album. And because uh, they're just everyone had their favorite. Every song was so great on that one. Yeah. How about you, Alan? Yeah. Um, I guess one of the reasons that I had suggested this as a topic is because of some of the things that you guys have already said, like how much fun it is. I mean, that's it among the Beatles solo releases. It stands alone really as an album that is just a kick, you know, I think also uh, the interesting thing about it is that, well, it's obviously by definition a super group. I mean, you know, just look at who's in it. I mean, that's what a super group is. And yet it's also sort of an anti super group. You know, the super groups, I mean, if you remember like when Blind Faith got together, everybody expected, wow, these are like all the these great virtuosic musicians and they went in and they made a sort of virtuosic album and super groups tend to do that. They tend to sort of be very earnest about their super groupness. And yet these guys were absolutely not taking it seriously. And because they didn't take it seriously, they produced a great album, two great albums. You know, I think it, Things like the, the line Ken mentioned, I'm so tired of being lonely with Roy Orbison singing, you know, for for those of us who did know Roy Orbison from way back, mm -hmm. that was just Absolutely. like, you know, not like not like an in joke. I mean, everybody sort of knew what it what it was, but it was like to have him come out and sing that in the middle of this song. It was just like you had to giggle, you know, and just and, mm -hmm. and that's the thing about both these albums. You know, it was also sort of like, I think a thumb in the eye to the sort of standard pop radio type record business. You know, on the second album, Wilbury Twist, you know, if you listen to the Wilbury Twist is all about like, we're now, we're now geezers, you know, <laughs> and we're right. doing what uh -huh. we do. And, you know, that is not the kind of song that, you know, a young pop group is going to do, but it, but, they were just saying, yeah, you know, we're doing this. It's very old time rock and roll, which was not the currently fashionable thing at the time. It really was just, you know, George and all of those guys doing sort of what they do, having a great deal of fun doing it. And it came over, I think, to the listener as just really just the joy to hear. I don't remember where I first heard the first album. I, I think, too, it must have been WNEWFM. I mean, you know, they used to play everything and, and they had very good Beatles connections. <laughs> and um, so it had to be that. I, I also have a pretty strong memory of seeing the video for Handle With Care and End of the Line come on MTV um, at the time. Does MTV play music anymore I don't, I don't even know if it does um <laughs> it's just sort of a serious question i didn't really watch it so but i mean I, I sort of started tuning out once they had all you know sort of reality show type programs and you know but in those days it was like the radio but with uh with with visuals and you know these guys put together some fun videos too which on the uh the Traveling Wilburys collection, which was the issue of the two albums. Um, there sort of is a disc two, actually. Disc two is the DVD um, that has has a few of those promos plus a little documentary. And I don't remember whether it was in this documentary that's on the disc or whether it was in the Martin Scorsese film about George, but. There was a film of all of them sitting. You remember all of them sitting around the table writing one of the yeah. songs and throwing out uh -huh. lines. And mm -hmm. I thought that was a lot of fun too. And it was, you know, exactly how you imagined it to be. So, uh, yeah, I'm just a, a, a really big Wilburys fan, and uh, don't know what else I can say about it. Uh, I think the song you're referring to, Alan, is "Dirty World." When they're throwing out lines like uh, "I love your big refrigerator," all that stuff. Yeah. So what's the right. end? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting that you mention MTV, Alan, 
because you know one would think you know one's image of the the kind of artists that MTV would cater to uh, when they were still, like you say when they were still playing music really you know doesn't really include artists like that and it's it probably should kind of refresh people on just how big basically each member of that band was at that moment in time Mm -hmm. because uh, you know uh, I mean Dylan was still considered to be a pretty much a superstar at that point Mm -hmm. George was a George was a Beatle hey you know Jeff Lynn uh, had a you know had a you know a very wide ranging resume not you know from the move and the electric light orchestra and beyond doing all kinds of production work and all and Tom Petty was as uh, as Ken mentioned at that moment in time was one of the biggest rock acts in the uh, in the country and actually his you know visibility wise it was it was far bigger at that point you know, than it would be, say, a decade or so later, maybe at the peak of his popularity. And in fact, that, that would be uh, another another year or so when, when Jeff Lynne produced the Full Moon Fever album, uh, produced one of the biggest hits of, um, of, uh, of Tom's career, and I won't back down, and running down a drink. And of course, Roy Orbison, who uh, at that point was a freshly minted member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And uh, for those of us of a certain age, so the first records we ever uh, really were turned on to were uh, back in 1960 and 61, 62, were by Roy, uh, were by Roy Orbison. So, uh, so even though none of the five are the kind of artists you automatically associate with MTV, the fact that they were, that they all had, you know, a you know, individual reputations, uh, rich individual reputations, definitely helped in uh, in giving them entree to MTV. Mm-hmm. You know, at, at, at the same time that uh, that they were playing, you know, Howard Jones and right. uh, you know the mm-hmm. synth bands and things like that. Well, also remember, you know, like George had the success with Cloud Nine, which not only was so successful on radio, but he was played to death on MTV with Got My Mind Set on You and also That's with true. When right. It Was Fab. Right. So that right. so that played right into this. This was only a year difference between Cloud Nine yeah. and the first yeah. Wilburys right. album. Mm-hmm. So And Tom Petty was also becoming or was a very not only a commercially successful artist, but a pioneer also himself in the music mm-hmm. video field at that time right yeah right very much so tom penny's been around been around so long but we we think of him as sort of the baby of the group here you know Mm -hmm. yeah yeah Yeah. well he was at the time i i have to go along with what alan said about mtv i'm positive that that's where i saw that's where i first heard this um because i saw i remember seeing the video and recording the video you know on my old VCR way back when um, because I loved it so much and because obviously George had something to do with it. But um, yeah, that's where I, that's where I first got wind of this. And, and, you know, uh, like everybody else, I went out and bought the album and I went out today and I hadn't, uh, to be honest, I hadn't heard the album for quite a while. And I was listening, I listened to both albums uh, more than the first one today than the second one. And I couldn't stop smiling. Alan, your point about, how much fun they were having is really a good one. I mean, they really, they were just, they were just kind of throwing it to the winds and, and doing, you know, what they wanted to do. And, you know, they didn't really care, you know, what anybody thought. And you could, you could tell, I mean, some of those songs, you know, like Wilbury Twist, you're exactly right that, you know, that's not something that, um, you know, that kind of song, you know, you would, you wouldn't want to, uh, you wouldn't program an album like this, you know, intentionally, I don't think you would basically just kind of do go in and do this for fun, and that's really what they did. Now, some you you guys mentioned the sitting around the table. I know there's um there's been bootleg footage out there of them, uh, a, a long long sessions of them. At, at, I I forget whose house it was at, but they of, all, of them all getting together. 
it's been floating around for years and years and years. But yeah, I mean, this is great. And also, there was a rumor for a while that um, they were going to get um, uh, Del Shannon in there after, I guess, after Roy passed. I think after Roy's death, yeah. Right, and of course, obviously, that didn't happen. But Del's the the album that Jeff Lynne produced for Del had a lot of Wilbury sounding songs in, in it. It's a great album. You mm-hmm. can, you can find it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, that's a, you know, uh, and of course they did run away, which uh, I was listening to that today and I just almost started cracking up. That is so, so cool to hear Jeff Lynn singing run away. And, and they basically cop- mm-hmm. copied the, uh, the arrangement, but yeah, I mean, this is, that's what's so, so great about this. Um, it's so different. It's, you know, George always had, you know, had these run-ins with record companies about what he should do and what he shouldn't do. And he just basically with this said, screw it. And with, you know, with, um, handle with care, handle with care is such a wonderful, wonderful song that stands, you know, that stands out on his own. And so it was so great for him to give that song to the Wilburys, you know, and let them use it because it is such a wonderful song and he could have done wonders with that song on his own and he basically you know let everybody you know have it and and they did they just did a great job i think it's a it's a really wonderful album well steve steve brings up an interesting point when he talks about the run-ins that george had had over the years with record companies uh because i was thinking of this uh, when i was playing the albums last week because we had just had the whole discussion about paul and about his willingness to work with artists who are kind of outside his, uh, you know, his milieu, if you want to put it that way, or, you know, his, uh, you know, his musical wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. Um, And George actually, he took kind of the opposite tack. He generally did only work with artists who were kind of his, his peers. And certainly this was a case uh, of that because of the, you know not only were they musical peers but they were also friends of his mm-hmm. and uh, and then certainly this is a you know so it made it that much more of a comfortable uh, fit for him and certainly for the others as well you know there was a it was definitely a uh, uh, you know leave your ego at the door type of uh, type of situation and may might not even have been that they may have just it may have just been you know five friends getting together and uh you know just having as alan said having fun recording recording a bunch of songs mm-hmm. i always wondered about the addition of tom petty because like somebody mentioned earlier he was really the baby of the group and he wasn't i mean we all know how big he is now and he was you know, he had some, he, he was famous a little bit then, but not nearly what he is today. So, I mean, he was really kind of the, the, the young well, guy. Well, he had had actually about, at that point, about a decade of, uh, um, uh, of pretty high quality, uh, you know, uh, material behind him. And he was, uh, as I as I mentioned, he was at that point. He was he was one of the bigger rock acts in the country. But I think his kind of his entree into that group was, I think, through Dylan. I think it was I think it was Dylan with whom he had become had become friends over the decade, and uh, and so that kind of got him in with the others. You know, plus it he was, was you know, obviously similar similar musical uh roots there was kind of a yeah, cross pollination a... going on um, at that time uh because i remember uh tom petty and bob dylan i believe toured together yes. uh they did do a song together i believe it was called band of the hand um right and then of course jeff lynn working with uh with george and uh uh, after that, then of course Lynn and Petty, and uh, you know someone you, you brought up Del Shannon before. I think Steve did, or uh, brought up Del Shannon. I vaguely remember hearing the possibility that Roger McGuinn would end up getting involved uh, mm. because Petty and McGuinn had had uh, worked together on the uh, Back to Rio album, or Back from Rio, Roger <laughs> McGuinn record. But uh, you know there were oh, there was this this great cross pollination that was going on at that time, and. Uh, I, I guess 
sometimes it's the uh, things you don't plan that end up being the best the best things that happen when when they're not when there is no plan and they you know uh, got together and sat down and it all came together beautifully if they had scripted it it wouldn't have you know worked out as well mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah right i think there's one I other think... thing to 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 remember about it which is that um and and it's in a way where tom petty comes in as one of them even though he was so you know clearly younger he he comes to it from the same kind of music making as george yeah. was doing and dylan was doing and beyond all that, I mean, keep in mind, it's, it's like 1987. You've got, as Al mentioned, the synth bands going on. George was talking around this time and a bit earlier about his, basically, his disgust with an aspect of the music business where everything was, as he put it, midi this and midi that. And, you know, and, and I think from his point of view, it wasn't real music making anymore. And here are the Wilburys doing exactly what George thinks it should be guys with guitars and basses and drums playing real music in a room. You know, the fact that it is, you know, real musicians playing real instruments uh, in a space is another thing. That's another aspect of it that I think is worth mentioning. Somebody mentioned about uh, uh, Tom Petty and Roger McGuinn. Um, I have Mm -hmm. a, I'm looking in a book here and um, McGuinn uh, did join Petty on stage for a show in uh, in 89. Yeah, McGuinn did, did join Petty on stage uh, in 89. They did four birds numbers together. So they did perform together at one point. What, was there any truth at all behind these rumors about trying to get either Roger McGuinn or Del Shannon? I even heard Carl Perkins was a consideration. Has yeah. any, Does anyone have any information about that, whether they really were approached? Were they approached? Or is it all just hearsay? I think it was all just basically fan speculation more than anything else. Because well, I never I never heard them make any really kind of on the record comments about, well, we're looking to, you know, make more uh, make more music and we uh, we're going to you know try to replace them. Because it, if you notice that after the second album, the, the concept disappeared. I have the Shannon album, and I and I know uh, obviously that Jeff Lynn's all over it. I don't think that anybody else is. I don't think any of the other group, any of the rest of the group is. I don't have it handy, so I can't double check that. But it sounds very Wilbury-ish because Jeff Lynn is all over it, and there's a very kind of yellow sound to it. But I, as I recall, none of the other guys are on it. Uh, Petty might be on it, but I don't think he is. Uh, mm. Anybody know for anybody know off the top? No, I know no, the song "Walk Away," remember, which is a, a great away. song. Walk away, yeah. Mm-hmm. Walk away was like the oh, the the uh, the radio hit from the album, if I remember correctly. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. It's been a long time since I've heard that. And there was yeah. a lot. There was a lot of cross. I hate to say cross pollination, but I mean there was a lot of guesting between various members on each other's albums. Oh, sure. For a while, um, uh, the one of the better examples is the. Um, that video, the the video, um, the I won't back down video that had George on yes. and everybody else. I remember watching mm-hmm. that on Midnight Special one night. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, you know, so, and Ringo, Ringo was in the video though. Right, he he doesn't right. play drums on the song, so right, you're right. That's right, Ringo. In fact, uh, as I recall, Ringo did kind of a goofy little thing where he he played to the camera a little bit, as I remember. But yeah, I mean, there was a lot of there was a lot of that going on, in the, you know. Darren, uh, yes, sir. Uh, see if you can uh, improve my memory here. Uh, I'm trying to think. I think, if I'm not mistaken, it wasn't too much longer after uh, Del Shannon's album that uh, that that Jeff Lynne had produced that um, that he committed suicide. Or am I? Yes. No, time? you're right. And I wish that again, as the, for some reason, this late eighties is like uh, I'm, I'm clearer on I think what happened musically ten years before that than in the late eighties. Yes. But yeah, <laughs> Dell, and I think that 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 must have been around the time that the rumors were beginning to swirl that Denham would be a perfect fit to step in for Roy mm-hmm. Orbison, and then he died. So uh, it yeah. happened right, uh, you know, at that at that point during that whole. 
you know, in between yeah, the two early, Wilburys early. albums in the late '80s. I have a guys. I have a reference book in my lap here that I'm looking at. Oh, uh, first of all, there was an album, and I don't recall this album. I'm, I'm gonna. I have to see if I can find it. Called "Drop Down and Get Me." That was released in '82, produced by Tom Petty. Um, anybody familiar with that? Because I'm not. That vaguely. I don't, it rings yeah, a bell for some vaguely. reason. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But then obviously, but the, but the, but Shannon died in 1990. It was 90. Okay. So right. it was very soon after. February. February yeah, yeah. In Santa Clarita. Uh, he. Um, yeah. And, and then Rock On was released in 91, according to this book. This is a, by the way, this is a the MTV Rock Encyclopedia. Rock On was released in 91. So. It would, and it's a great album. I mean, it really, it really is. I have, I have to be honest though. I have not heard "Drop Down and Get Me." I'm going to have to go hunting for that one and look and see if I can find it. So then, having had two, you know, one member of the actual group, and then another one who was under, presumably under consideration as a possible replacement for Roy, having the two of them die within two years of each other, that probably is uh, contributed to the fact that the, that the project never really, uh, you know, had legs beyond those two albums. Right. Right. Which is really a shame because it would, yeah. it would have been, I mean, I'm glad that they, I'm glad that Olivia finally got this together and, you know, remastered because they, the, the albums were hard to get for a while, you know? And so I'm glad that they, we finally, have that drop down and get me i'm looking uh is available on cd it's not uh it's not out of print for anybody that wants to get it Mm. i'm assuming that the two wilbury's albums which were on wilbury records uh part of uh, warner brothers were kind of under george harrison's contractual uh, agreement with warner brothers so that when george's dark horse albums disappeared the Wilburys albums went at the same time, I assume. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I think so. I don't. Uh, I don't that, really know if that's all part of the same contract. I don't know if that's true. I don't know that it was part of the same contract, but I think there was a bit of, uh, uh, you know, a tie-in with George. You know, the fact that that George was part of it. Uh, I think that they they were real happy to. You know, they, they were glad to to do it. I, I think it definitely there was. I think there was a connection there. It's interesting how it came together uh, because the five artists, well, George was uh, with uh, Warner Brothers at the time, but Dylan was on Columbia. Uh, right. I guess Jeff Lynn technically probably didn't have a recording contract. Petty was with MCA. Uh, yes. And I don't know what the situation was with Roy Orbison uh, at that time, but I'm surprised that, that now you think about the legal end of things, it's a little surprising that it, it happened. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, look at Rockpile back, you know, they were around for so many years in the 70s, but could never record because uh, Lynn, uh, Lynn, uh, Nick Lowe and uh, and Dave Edmonds were on different labels. Yeah. And and the um, the reissue was done through Rhino, which is interesting, too. So, well, Rhino owned, had control of the archives of uh, of Warner Brothers and Atlantic and ah, Electra that's Asylum right. yeah. and all of that. Yeah. So, I you know I'm I would guess and, and and I'm just taking a wild guess that given the the name you know when you have Dylan and Harrison and and to a certain extent Orbison and Jeff Lynn who actually Jeff remember Jeff Lynn was pretty big in those was bigger in those days than he is now. Um, oh sure. When you have four powerhouses like that, and and Petty also, but I mean, when you have some mm-hmm. powerhouse names of just Harrison and Dylan, and somebody says to you, "Would you like to put out a record by by these two guys?" You're going to go, "Um, no, we can't." You know, I I think there were some jumping through hoops to get that to get that record out. You know. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. I think a very important aspect of the Traveling Wilburys. I think that. Um, Jeff Lynn was really the glue that kept it all together. And the fact that he was working as a producer for, for really all these artists, with the exception of Bob Dylan, he, he found a way. You know, when you think about it, all rock fans have their own musical tastes. And I'm sure that everyone that heard about the Traveling Wilburys, if you, if you mention the five names there, you would have had different levels of interest in each one of them. Maybe some of them 
like George the most. Maybe some of them like Tom Petty more than the others. But Jeff brought a certain amount of commerciality to the Traveling Wilburys in a way where, let's just say, you recognize Bob Dylan as one of the greatest songwriters of all time, but maybe you're not a big fan of his stuff. He's far more accessible this way. The songs are more commercial. They have a sense of humor. You know, he's blending with these all these other great, great artists. It makes it far more acceptable to the general public. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you, there's such a benefit when you combine all these talents together where let's just say you're a Tom Petty fan, but you're not really that big on George Harrison. Well, you got a record with the two of them together. It only helps to appreciate George through Tom Petty or vice versa. You know, that's that's the beauty of this whole thing. But um, Jeff proved to be the, the key component in all of this and not only helping the Traveling Willoughbys. I mean, it, it's really the five of them together that made the magic that it was. But the fact that he produced George and had success with George and then he produced Tom Petty and Roy Orbison had success with them, too. He knew what to bring to each of those artists. And at the time, it was the right sound. So... You add all that with, with the, 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 the humor of the Traveling Wilburys, and it was just an incredible chemistry and all the right elements. But Jeff was really what, to me, was the glue of it all. That's a good point, Ken, because I, I was not much of a Tom Petty fan at the time. In fact, I still, to this day, am probably in the minority here amongst a lot of rock music fans. I was never crazy about anything Tom Petty did until no, you know, maybe don't come around here no more. <laughs> But when, say, Damn the Torpedoes came out, and that was a big album there. You had Refugee, you had a Don't Do Me Like That, you know, those, those were really big rock songs at the time. You weren't a fan of that? No, I, I didn't like, I still really, it's not really, I don't really like those tunes. You know, it, it, it started to change for me, I guess, I think Southern Accents for some, whatever, for some reason. Perhaps having access to them at WFUV, Southern Accents, I think was the first Petty album that came out that I was able to listen to you know, on my own terms and to find other tracks than what was getting played on the radio. You know, I was far from being a Petty fan, but the Wilburys kind of put me over the top and then Full Moon Fever blew me away. So it, it, it's, it's exactly what you just said, Ken. I wasn't much of a Petty fan, but the Wilburys, uh, you know, there was enough other stuff there. And then I, it kind of made me a Tom Petty fan. Mm. I, you know, I, I appreciated Penny because of his birds influence, his heavy mm -hmm. birds influence. I loved, I've always yeah. been a big fan of the birds and, um, hearing Penny do that stuff was great. I also remember hearing the, the live stuff he did with Dylan. You guys hear that? That, uh, oh, well, the, the, the 92, uh, Dylan, uh, are, are you talking about the the night the, the Bob Fest, or are you talking about the the tour that they did together? The tour, the tour. Oh, yeah, that I, don't, was, I don't think so. That was really really good. There's a I know there's a live recording of at least one of those days floating around that is just absolutely amazing. I don't know if, if I don't know if anyone else will agree with me, but the Traveling Wilburys happened at a time uh, that was a huge shot in the arm for Bob Dylan. The 1980s is a decade that wasn't necessarily kind to Bob, or maybe mm -hmm. it was the other way around. Bob, Bob wasn't necessarily kind to the eighties because I've come to uh, realize that there's always a method to Bob's madness, whether it's his Christmas album or his current Sinatra record. But in the eighties, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, he did two consecutive uh, albums of folk and blues covers. And then, uh, oh, no, that's the early nineties. I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm thinking of the uh, the two records he did side by side in the mid mid eighties, knocked out, loaded, and yes. uh, mm -hmm. uh, down in the groove. Um, arguably, two of the weakest albums in his uh, discography, and I'm sure there are some Dylan fans that would disagree with me. Although, but, just before those two, he did an album with uh, Mark Knopfler called Infidels, so, yeah. which was much oh, yes. better than those. Right, right. So, right. And then there was Empire Burlesque, which was a little bit of a step yeah. down, but knocked out loaded. And, and I remember down in the groove and his time with the great working with the Grateful Dead had a lot of Dylan fans kind of scratching their heads going, oh, yeah. you know, and then along comes the Traveling Wilburys thing. And uh, 
So that was a, a good, you know, a shot in the arm probably for him also. Uh, get him back in the public's eye again if he drifted away a little bit. You well, know, anyway. something else about about the traveling Wilburys, and it, it also makes you even more aware that far back of how radio defined itself. Because if I remove my own bias for George Harrison here, I still would say that the songs on the two albums are terrific tracks. And to mm-hmm. me, songs like Handle With Care and End of the Line, She's My Baby, which I thought was a terrific rock song, fantastic mm-hmm. rock song, or Wilbury Twist, they all deserve to be big hits on the singles charts. The Top 40 mm-hmm. Radio didn't play <laughs> the Traveling Wilburys, really. It was really only rock radio that played them, as well as MTV. So it was a combination of that that made the, the album sell fairly well, even though Volume 3 the second album, really didn't sell. I think it, it almost made the top 10, mm-hmm. whereas uh, the first album went to number three, I believe. But, uh, you know, but still, those songs really deserve to be hits because they really are strong commercially and, and the fact that it's, you know, those musicians working together. Yeah. By that point, though, um, you know, in, in the late 80s, what had become at that point CHR radio, you know, contemporary hit radio. Um, it was you know, much like it would be, uh, you know, even to even today. They simply would not play artists that were as, you know, old as as those five gentlemen, you know, e- including Tom yeah. Petty. But however, uh, a year before that, Got My Mind Set on You was a number one record. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah. when it was fat, went top 40. And then when you get into Full Moon Fever, I Won't Back Down was a huge hit. So why yeah. couldn't the Traveling Wilbury singles do as well? Well, I don't know about the singles. That, that, the, the albums were, the albums were, uh, were pretty big hits. Um, right. Volume 1 hit number 3, because I'm looking at the, mm. the Billboard stuff. And Volume 3, which I'm surprised, hit number 11. Oh, that's what I said. That's what that I thought. What you yeah. said? Is that what you said? Okay. Yeah. But uh, that's it. Just goes to show you that even that far back, there was this division between rock radio, what they were playing, and what Top Forty was playing. So yeah, um, yeah. that's that's true. It's true. Although, in fact, if I remember correctly, I think I think End of the Line got some country airplay. Really? Uh, Ooh, I could it, you know? I could be wrong, but I think I seem to recall that it did get some country airplay probably because of the Roy Orbison connection. Hmm. Yeah. Also, we should just talk about the songs because they really sure. are tremendous songs that are on both albums. In particular, I'm just looking at the first album here, but aside from Handle with Care, which I thought was just brilliant, Dirty World is such a fun song. And there, there we're talking about Bob Dylan where, you know, it's a far more commercial song. It's a funny song. It's more acceptable to the general public, I think, than his more serious work, I would think. That's just my mm-hmm. take on it. For people who don't really, that they're not really big fans of Dylan, uh, a song like Rattled, what a great rockabilly song right there that Jeff Lynne did. It, it could have fit mm-hmm. anything from the Carl Perkins catalog there or, uh, sure. you know, what Dave Edmonds would, would put out. You know, it's not alone mm-hmm. anymore. Is so so much in the wheelhouse, as you would put it. Al of uh, mm-hmm. Roy Orbison. It's mm-hmm. so perfect. Yeah. Again, this whole idea of loneliness. This this thing about loneliness with Roy Orbison that they keep on bringing up. But it's such a you know a, a great moment mm-hmm. there vocally for Roy. You know, is one the big shining moment of all for Roy on the album. Last night got a lot of airplay on rock radio. I mean, yes. there's there's Tom Petty right there. It it definitely got uh, tons of airplay. I think that's why. I've always had a problem with the second album with volume three is that I just, it just doesn't, you know, it doesn't hold together, you know, uh, for me quite as well as the first one. And I think it's because of the absence of Roy Orbison. Well, and there's also not a lot of George on the second album either. I well, mean, that's, that's true. true. Uh, in yeah. terms of vocals. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably more of a petty, uh, petty Jeff Lynn album. You know, the one thing about Volume 3 versus Volume 1, I think it's not so much that, you know, 3 was uh, not quite as good as, as 1, but 3 mm-hmm. is still a, a pretty pretty 
monster record. I think it's more mm-hmm. how great one was. You just yes. couldn't. You couldn't come up with volume one, part two. You know what I mean? I just, it was mm-hmm. impossible. One was virtually perfect. You know, anything they did after that, as mm-hmm. great as it was, was bound to fall a little short. Right. Um, you know, and if they did do a third album, as great as it probably would have ended up being, it was bound, we'll never know, but it probably mm-hmm. would have also failed to live up to what Volume 1 was. Volume 1 was virtually a perfect record. Right. Yeah, very much so. E- Even to close with End of the Line, which was a perfect song <laughs> oh, to, to end no the question. album with, you know? Yeah. You guys didn't mention Congratulations, which uh, I, I between yeah. Teddy and that's, Dylan, that, that's a wonderful song. Yeah. Um, One song that I play all the time on the radio, and I did back in my DHA days, was um, Heading for the Light, which I thought would have yes. been a, a big hit. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. I think some some reason, maybe it's because it's in the middle of side two, I kind of equate that song with I Want to Tell You. I don't know why, yeah. <laughs> but it, uh, maybe it has that kind of feel to it. Yeah, well, there's some, some melodic uh, similarities, too. Right. 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 You know, a little bit of a little little bits of the melody are kind of close, which is. Yeah, I think that I think the chord progression is similar. Open. And Tweeter and the Monkey Man got a lot of airplay. You know, it's mm-hmm. it was as close to perfect as you could get for that first album. Right. Yeah. How did you feel, Alan, comparing the two albums? I mean, I think that the uh, the the lack of Roy Orbison made a big difference, and um, you know, just because the, the the chemistry was just a little bit different without him, and uh, you know, I like a lot of those songs, oh, yeah. like Wilbur Twist. I, yeah, I don't think that there are any um, really bad spots in it. I think that it's just that, um, in a way, the joke had been done once, and um, now here they were doing it again, and without one of the major members but I, I i like the third album i i don't i i agree that the first one is is a bit better but um but i enjoy listening to the third one as well meaning the second one mm-hmm. yeah when i did listen to the the second album last week um and it was the first time i'd listened to it in quite a while uh even though it's not for me, at least, up to the the level of the first album, for the reasons I stated earlier, it's still it's it's a it's it holds up very nicely as a as a you know a, as a fine rock record. With I a great agree. ending, <laughs> Wilbury, Wilbury Twist, Twist might be my favorite of all of their songs because mm-hmm. it's just so off the wall. I mean, it just put your teeth in a glass, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> hop around the room in your underwear. <laughs> but uh you know there's a lot of gems on that album and in particular a favorite of mine is you took my breath away which i think is a really pretty tune between jeff and tom so mm-hmm. uh i love that one and the devil's been busy was very commercial to me i think that that could work as it could have worked as a single so mm-hmm. um and inside out was also uh that they made a video for that song a very commercial yeah. song right there yeah i'd forgotten about that one and they, there's even the reference to Twist and Shout in there. So. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, one more thing I, I'd like to bring up about the Traveling Wilburys is that um, I do recall, like in the early 90s, or probably around the time when, when the Wilburys were recording, that George was asked, when is he going to put out his next album? And he pretty much said that uh, it's much more fun to record with the Wilburys. So... I think a lot of people may not even be aware sometimes that Cloud Nine was really the last full studio album that George made while he was alive. And yes. sometimes it's easy not to think that way because he had the two Traveling Wilburys albums. He had the Best of Dark Horse compilation. He had mm-hmm. the live double album. So there was other stuff coming out. But then just think about it. He never did release another studio album while he was alive. No. All. No. An all George Harrison album. So... This is what he preferred doing. And I also remember around the time when Cloud9 came out that George was saying that he was looking for someone to help produce his album 
to share the burden with him. Well, I also think by being in the Traveling Wilburys, he missed that the fun aspect of being in a band again. But the shoulder wasn't, not everything was on his shoulder. You know, it, it was everybody contributing at the same time. So I think that, um, you know, the Traveling Wilburys in, in some way contributed to George not releasing his own solo music. Probably. Uh, plus the fact that not long after that, uh, the anthology project came up. And that mm-hmm. obviously, obviously took up a lot of their a lot of their time, oh, especially in the period from say ninety ninety two ninety three onward through ninety six really. Mm-hmm. Right, but George then, has his own and, studio. George has his own yeah. studio in his own home. So at at any time at his leisure, he could record stuff if right. he wanted to, right, and mm-hmm. record it. So and he did. You know, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Does anyone feel that it was a shame that the Traveling Wilburys didn't continue, maybe with another member? I mean, for one thing, I would have loved to have seen a tour with these musicians, you know, even even know. without Roy Orbison. I, I think that if they had, especially if they had toured behind it, I think it would have kind of taken away some of the, the fun aspect of it. Because especially at that at that moment in time, I think really of the of the five of them, I think really only Tom Petty was doing a lot of touring. You know, Bob really hadn't started doing the you know what's been called the never ending tour, where he just tours and tours and tours and tours. He hadn't really gotten into that quite that level yet of touring. So I don't know. I have a feeling that uh, if they had toured behind uh, either of the two albums, uh, and obviously the if it was the second one that would have been without without Roy, that it probably would have detracted from the fun aspect of the original concept. Can you imagine how that mm. would have worked out though? Technically, I mean, how it would have, you know, all the all the rigmarole they would have had to go through to put a show like that together and, and everything yeah. and, and all the, all the, you know, all the people behind it, the very thing that George couldn't stand, he did, he would have had to have gone through for that. And, and you'll notice that it was in fact, actually right behind or almost right behind the, the second album that George did do those two weeks of shows with Eric Clapton in Tokyo and realized how much he hated it. And, and, and stop doing it. Mm-hmm. So, Actually, um, no, I, that's not true. No, no. the The second album came out in 1990, and the tour of right, Japan but, was the end of 91. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. There, there was not long, not long afterward. Um, okay, and you know that he did those two weeks of touring and found the, you know, that he just hated it. And it's very possible that if they had, had toured as a, you know, as a, you know, a Wilburys tour, that the same thing might have happened. He might have gotten through two weeks of that and decided, the heck with this. Now, do you know for a fact that George felt that way about that tour? Because I, I also remember hearing that there were plans for George to tour America. And the problem was that Eric Clapton needed his band, so George wouldn't have the band at his disposal. I don't know. I see if I... If I remembering correctly i think it was you know the fact that he stopped after those two weeks was because he just didn't like the whole aspect of of having to you know play every night and uh and the and the touring and all and you know with all the traveling and all i think um he just you know because obviously he didn't uh, he had never liked touring you know he was going all the way back to the beatles mm-hmm. you know which is why he only did the one the the one tour in his solo career, you know, the one tour in the seventies. Well, it could also have well been that because of the bad reaction he got from the media from that tour, I think that had serious repercussions on him. I think if he had gotten really good reviews of that tour, it might have been a little bit different. Eh, you know, it's he possible. may have toured again. Yeah, it's possible, but he just he just never really you know, through his, really the entirety of his career. You know, like I said, even going back to the Beatles, he just, you know, just did not like the the touring life. Okay. Anyone want to comment on this? I think the, um, I, it goes back to the first album being so, in my mind, perfect. It was, 
it was a it was a, a nice, pleasant, unplanned accident that they all ended up working together. And um, I think they all realized probably that you ju- that was just something that happened. It worked. You're not going to be able to recapture that again. Why ruin mm-hmm. it by taking it to the road? And yeah. oh, I can't. I can't. I'm booked to do a year. Uh, you know, when I have an album coming out, well, you know, scheduling also probably was a huge issue to that. But um, mm. that first album, the experience of doing that first album was so natural. Anything after that, you know, probably you, you get the businessmen involved, the record companies involved, concert promoters involved. Suddenly it's not fun anymore. And it lo- mm. would lose its its uh, magic. Yeah, I for think, lack of a better word. I, yeah, I think that's exactly it because this was basically the the first album was so so much fun. You can hear it in their voices as they're singing, you know, and they're not worried about record label bottom line, you know, black and white sheets and all that crap. They're not worried about that. They're just worried about playing and to to go to have to take that on the road with all the even the, even though. You know, they're probably a little bit removed from that being who they are. But having to take that on the road and and put up the whole Wolverine's persona and all that, I think would have would have ruined it for him. And and they didn't you know, they they wanted to keep things as it was. So I can fully understand them not doing that. I think you're right. The one the one aspect of the the music business that George Harrison hated was the business side of the business. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. You guys yeah, are right I, about that. I, I think that's really obvious that, that that's the reason why it didn't happen. And it, and it may actually be the reason why it never really continued because, you know, after the, you know, after the second album, um, yeah, after the second album, they just, it was just kind of, you know, you know, here we're going to have to plan, we're going to have to run this by record people and, you know, we don't want to do this stuff. And and obviously other things have changed too because of Roy's passing, you know, but mm-hmm. um it I mean the, the the good thing is that the the guy the the three surviving guys still have that Wilbury aura around them, which is really kind of interesting, you know. Um and um I can't think offhand that, you know, the the guy the they've done anything together, but I mean there's there's still that that Wilbury thing around them, if you think about it. And that's really kind of, kind of cool. All right. So this has been great. This conversation about the traveling Wilburys. If any of you would like to get in touch with us, we have an email address, which is things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. And don't forget, we also have our own Facebook page for things we said today. And before we close, just want to thank everybody for writing to us. We've gotten a lot of uh, great response lately on our Facebook page, and also to our email. So keep it coming. We really appreciate it. Again, the uh, email address is things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. All right, so thanks so much for listening. On behalf of Gaga Wilbury, Crispy Wilbury, Shorty Wilbury, and Stinky Wilbury, I'm Leggy Wilbury, thanking you all for listening, and we'll see you at the end of the line.